Welcome to the B2B Category Creators Podcast, hosted by Gil Alouche, founder and CEO of Metadata.io. This podcast is all about sharing the real and sometimes uncomfortable secrets of category creation in the B2B software space. On this week's episode, we have Melissa Wong, CEO of Zipline, a retail store operations platform, and Alex Colmer, founder and CEO at VidMob, an intelligent creative platform. Happy Friday, Alex and Melissa, and to everyone who is listening. Uh, my name is Gil Alush. I am the founder and CEO of Metadata. This is the category creation podcast number I don't remember, and I'm very excited to have this uh this podcast today. Um, we'll just start with a simple introduction. Um, Melissa, maybe you can start us off. You can tell us briefly about yourself and your company. Sure. So I'm Melissa. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Retail Zipline. And what Retail Zipline is, is a SaaS um, solution for retailers to enable better execution and engagement in source. So what are essentially the operational backbone for over 60 um, of the world's best brands, including Nike, Lululemon, Lush, Ivy, Lego, um, Rite Aid. So a lot of American Eagle, Casper, Warby Parker. So we support 100% of the stores to make sure that what corporate's asking the stores to do actually gets done. Very cool. And I think yesterday I told Alex that you have a very famous uh, investor and he knew right away who that investor was. I did, I did mention that she was a tennis player. Uh, oh, yeah. Very cool. She didn't Serena Williams. Name. Serena Williams. That's, that's the yeah. one. That's super cool. Are you not allowed to say it? No, but I was, I was like, which one? Because then in our last fundraise, we actually um, had an investor join Matt Wallach from Viva, the co-founder of mm. Viva. So, nice. I don't know like Matt. That. How did you and Serena get connected and how did you get her? Is, is she looking for, you know, SaaS retail platforms to invest in? Or? <laughs> it was kind of weird, huh? So it's like, um, it was like our series A raise. We were really overcommitted. <laughs> and um, it, she, the call kind of like came last minute. Like we had, like everyone's like, you know, fighting, blah, blah, blah. And then um, Allison Rappaport contacted us and was like, so I heard from someone that actually, no, maybe it was an investor. She was like, so I know Serena Williams person and she's interested in learning more. And I was like, no one says no to Serena Williams, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we obviously made room, but I think for Serena, she's really focused on investing in things that help ordinary people mm -hmm. in, their or uh, in everyday lives, everyday lives, everyday people in their everyday lives. And because our solution helps the millions, like retail is like the most populous job in America. And we're really helping to improve their life through better ways of working and giving them time back. It resonated with her. So, I mean, it is a little bit kind of weird because we're not like sports or health or, I mean, we're, we enable better clothing sales, but it's like the start far reach, but I think it's because of who we serve. Uh, so. Super cool. Um, uh, that's awesome. Alex, Happy to make maybe, an intro. <laughs> uh, you should, you should, yeah, you should talk if Alex, if you're looking for Serena Williams, it sounds mm -hmm. like you have an in. No, I'm just a fan. Yeah. Uh, you know, both a, as an athlete and as a person, she seems, she seems mm -hmm. great. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Alex Colmer. I'm the founder and CEO of VidMob, uh, a husband and father of, uh, two boys, uh, an 11 year old and a 13 year old. And now like every other person on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, I have a puppy. Um, <laughs> so, which is really funny when you go out and walk her at like 11.30 at night and there's like 3000 people walking their puppies around. That's it's hilarious. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty funny. Um, but VidMob is, um, it's a platform to help marketers both scale all of their digital content, uh, particularly video and, and more sort of complex media types. Uh, and then an, an intelligence system to help them learn sort of which creative decisions uh, are actually helping or inhibiting uh, the performance of their ad creative. So we've tried to, um, there's a lot of information out there about which ads are working. There's a lot of information out there about 
how well they're working. There's essentially no information out there about why. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what our platform is trying to get to. Totally. That's awesome. Super cool. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, I think, Alex, yesterday you told me that you, you have both your parents are professors and you dropped out of university and then they made you pay your way back and you started a huge <laughs> bar or, or something like that. Yeah, so that's funny. Yeah, I mean, um, that's all essentially true. Uh, my, my parents are, are both professors there um, and they're both scientists, uh, micro microbiologists and, and botanists. So I grew up in a, oh. in a household where dinner conversation was all about you know, plant pathology, um, you know, sort of sequencing of the plant genome and things that my sister and I were probably not entirely oh enthralled with. Um, amazing. And so I went, uh, I went to Cornell, I was a, a structural engineer, so more sort of larger scale um, math oriented. Uh, but mostly I was young and um, probably not curious enough about those things. And so I played soccer, I hung out with, with friends and um wasn't a stellar student and um i don't know that anyone talked in terms of kpis back then but my parents were not impressed with my kpis <laughs> and so after my i guess it was my first semester sophomore year we kind of had like a heart to heart and they're like well you know is this as well as you can do like do you think you could yeah and i'm and i was like no i think if i applied myself i could probably do a good amount better great and, answer and they're like, well, then do you think that this is a very good use of our hard and hard earned money? <laughs> and I agreed that it wasn't. And um, we basically set a benchmark that if I didn't get, I would pay my way through school. And so uh, anyway, long story short, uh, I did not achieve that. I, I filled out like a voluntary leave of absence and, and left college when I was, I guess, 19. And, you know, I had really kind of no skills. Um, and not much of anything, to be honest. And, and I had to come up with now, I don't even know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to to go back. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I started bouncing at a, one of the popular bars on campus, and and then took over kind of a catering business that was run out of that to provide liquor to all the fraternity and sorority parties, and then took over the bar itself. And so when I was nineteen, I had a couple hundred people working for me, and and sort of learned quickly about you know responsibility and you know, all the things that are important in life. So I spent a year doing that. I actually met my wife during that period, um, which is kind of crazy because she was actually like um, quite, you know, she was the captain of the swim team and I'm not sure she's ever done anything wrong in her life. And uh, somehow she, uh, she stuck with me. And um, after a year I, I went back and, and now that I was sort of writing checks to pay my way, um, I went to class and when you go to class, they teach you what you need to, to learn. And like, yeah, basically got straight A's and had these two very distinct experiences. Um, and I wouldn't change it at all. Like I would do both. I would do the first part again. It was great. And I think it's a formative part of who I am. I would fail. Uh, I, I failed other times as well. Um, and, you know, that was sort of where I became an entrepreneur and for better or for worse, I just was never able to really turn it off after that. That's beautiful. I love that background story. Uh, awesome. Well, we'll start with another sip. Uh, thanks again for joining as guests. Uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting conversation. Um, you know, I started this uh, podcast because we, I am, like many other founders, um, want to start a category. And I know what I don't want to do. I sit in a room and argue uh, about words and and, and taglines and, and all kinds of things for hours, but there are much, much better ways. So I'm trying to learn from, from the best. Uh, and, and it's exciting to, to, to hear about the tactics and strategy, but also just because I find it very therapeutic to actually sit down with founders and CEOs and talk about the founder journey. So maybe we can start there. Um, maybe, uh, Alex, maybe you can start us off. Maybe you can, you can tell us about... Uh, the most memorable hashtag fail moment. You're just talking about failure. The most memorable hashtag fail moment you had with your with your current company. Well, it's a, it's a good. Uh, so I think the most memorable moment probably was was the, actually like the first few months post COVID. To be honest, it's like it's a little later in it, but um, you know, going through that process where in sort of call it March and early April, 
where the world was kind of seemingly falling apart and there was a barrage of um you know sort of like thought pieces coming out from like all the you know venture prognosticators and uh consultant you know folks yeah it was all basically like you'll never cut deep enough and you'll never cut fast enough and you'd have to start firing everyone and i just felt like that was like everywhere um and business was definitely looked like it was going to be down and you know we were in this like really kind of pivotal moment about like what how to respond um and you know we talked as a board and 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 amongst like the leadership team here and sort of decided that like whatever it took we were going to like you know basically keep employing everyone uh and 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 that you know we sort of felt like that was a bigger responsibility than than than, than anything else and you know and then luckily we sort of started to see soon thereafter that um you know people were still going to need to communicate and there were and the, there were needs and that COVID was actually pushing people towards more kind of mm -hmm. need for more remote and collaborative and software-based systems and and you know it sort of became clear within a few months that that COVID was actually going to be a, a good thing for us but yeah. that 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 period there was definitely I think the most memorable where it felt kind of existential um and, and you know the decisions we were making you know you know we're definitely very much in the face of like it felt like a tide of uh, of, of wisdom from everyone else but it just like all the wisdom felt wrong to me um mm -hmm. and, and uh, that, that's sort of the first thing that popped to mind I'm in a dilemma, and on one hand, I'm going to click the reaction and clap, because I think that's commendable what you did. But on the other hand, you didn't talk about the hashtag fail moment. It sounds like you succeeded big time. Yeah, I mean, in, but it, I don't know, like, I feel like, in a sense... Yeah, I guess I, I guess I guess so. I mean, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna have you uh, definitely drink some for that. Uh, Melissa, <laughs> Melissa, you have to talk about so, an actual. I know. So I'm actually gonna I was gonna pop in and kind of like defend Alex because when you ask the question like, what's the biggest hashtag like failure moment? Like, as you reflect back as a founder, like a lot of the failure moments aren't actually failure because you just like learn more, right? It's like the only times when you're really like, wow, I really like, that was really a failure. It's like some meetings, it might be a prospect meeting or investor meeting. And you're like, you just like eat it. Right. But the decisions you make for your company where you failed, I think like, I think it's hard for us because it's more about like, how do we move forward? And like, similar to Alex, I was thinking like, okay, you know, what would I have done differently? And, and, and similar Alex, for us, it's, it's, we, we kept people as well, but we also didn't anticipate the increase in demand for the product. So then we were very slow in hiring and I just got kind of like run over a little bit. So we were like making up for that. But to me, like, is that a failure? Would I do it differently? Given what I knew at the time, we did with the best that we could. But now as I look forward, I think like, okay, Maybe I personally should be less um, hesitant on hiring when I see certain signs, right? Because it's like, when do you really, I mean, we've gotten to the points that we have because we've, we've navigated the business in certain ways. So it's like, what is true failure? <laughs> oh, I can, I'm going to, first of all, I think it's very kind of you to defend Alex. I think that's great that both of you are, are standing up for each other. But I think both of you just failed talking about failures. I can, <laughs> I talk about fail. I have like a thousand things that come up to my mind. I remember, I, you know, giving someone $10,000 less in a salary because one of my VCs convinced me that because of their location, uh, they should get paid less or something. It was like five years ago and it was, 100% a big failure that, that broke trust with that person. He bounced out. Yeah. I was pissed. And I did probably 999 other failures like that since. Uh, so I'm going to go back to Alex because I bet at this point <laughs> you have at least one bad hashtag fail moment that legitimately made you lose sleep and think, fuck, I shouldn't have done that. Excuse my language. Yeah, uh, no, listen, I mean, I've had plenty. I mean, plenty of failed moments in, in my life um, and and more so in, in other sort of company ventures. Vidmob's been sort of a blessed existence. It's always been on a pretty good trajectory. 
my previous company had some massive failures. You know, we we ended up, um, you know, stuck in a massive lawsuit between you know two large companies, and it essentially destroyed my destroyed my business. Uh, and so I went through like a multi year lawsuit and fought it all the way to the end, and you know ended up having you know all of our employees you know, you know let go and. Um, it took years to sort of re start rebuilding the business from that. And, and, you know, there were the failures that led to that were sort of an inadequate, an inadequate understanding of leverage. You know, we felt like the, 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 this was, we had just made a big game called Def Jam Rapstar. And it was in the wake of um, Guitar Hero and Rock Band and, you know, mm. rap as big as, you know, as big as rock and you know we felt like this was a billion dollar property and that you know that we were going to have an enormous amount of leverage in negotiations and it turned out that as that category collapsed we sort of lost leverage and and you know our, our partner ended up you know, not being a great partner um but i basically had a you know valuable business essentially taken away from from you know me and all of our investors through you know decisions that i would like to you know have again um I think at VidMob, at VidMob, probably the biggest fail moments was just early on, um, not getting to understanding what our specific focused product opportunity was quick enough. You know, like I, I held on to a consumer application probably longer than than I should have, when it was clear that it, it sort of it started to become clear that this was really a business a business play, and uh, you know that that probably delayed things a little bit. Thank you for that. Going back to the previous one that you mentioned, what did you learn from that tough, super tough experience? Not, not, you know, not understanding leverage quick, quick enough or, or, you know, kind of losing the, having the business taken, taken away from you and your investors. You know, I think you learn all, like, I learned about like sort of fortitude and, uh, you know, for me, strategically, um, you know, now I would think about sort of leverage and negotiation differently and probably plan for, do a better job of understanding and planning for downside. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm naturally almost, I'm, I'm optimistic almost to the point of insanity. Um, and, <laughs> and, and so I like that. And I often say like, I'd rather be an optimist and be wrong most of the time than be a pessimist and always be right. But you know, I think like what I learned there was that, you know, like that we could sort of survive, that if you can survive long enough, you can win in the end. Um, and, 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 and so we sort of, you know, stuck through this thing much longer than probably anyone would have. I mean, I, I think I worked for over two years without paying myself a penny. Um, and when, when I told that story to one of our early investors in Vidmop, um, it was, you know, a well-known, well-respected VC. He basically was just like, all right, stop. I don't want to hear anymore. Just send me the wire information. Um, and so this, this thing that I had sort of taken as kind of like a stain on, on, you know, my, my personal experience ended up becoming kind of like a platform, you know, to, to sort of build upon for the next chapter of my career. Absolutely. I think that's exactly what I was hoping to get to. I mean, when you said, hey, Vidmod was kind of a blessing, I'm like, yeah, you've done like a bunch of businesses. You've kind of made all the mistakes already, or many of them early, and probably VCs um, saw that pattern on you. Uh, we're going to jump into category creation very, very soon, but Melissa, take two yeah, on hashtag I mean, fail. So I can think of like specific. So I would just like to set the context that I think um, in contrast to Alex. So Alex, I'm actually like, a very reluctant entrepreneur. So it was like very, um, like very interesting listening to your story about like how you came to be where you are today and that growth trajectory, like in contrast, um, before Zipline I actually was in retail for 10 years. <laughs> so for over a decade, right? And I am a risk averse person, like, and, but I kept on trying to solve the problem of too much communication in too many different places for the stores and getting in trouble by my boss because they're like, oh, the stores didn't, you know, which you know ultimately rolled up to the CEO because they're like trying to do these, um, move the levers of the business to like move through inventory or, you know, do markdowns or whatever. And the stores weren't doing the thing. And so I kept on doing communication evolutions within the business. And it literally was, I think probably like a year 
um, of really going back and forth, like, should I quit my job? Is it the right thing to quit my job? Do you know what I mean? Like my 80 year old mother told me like, it got to the point where my, like, I get, I have like an 80 year old Asian mother, right? And she was like, what's the worst thing that can happen? You can always come back and live with dad and I, right? So I was like, oh God, when, you're, when your 80 year old mother is telling you to just quit your job and try it, right? And, and create the solution that you always wanted to exist in the industry, um, I was like, well, I, I guess I should do it, right? And sometimes I joke now that like the reason we're successful is because I didn't want to end up back with my parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like, it's interesting like to hear your journey uh, because I feel like you really like embrace the, the change and, and kind of like the, the journey. And I have always kind of been like, kind of like dragged by it, I would say. Um, and and in that sense, like it's been fortunate in that we've had a very like pointed view on what to build, who or people were, what the value you're bringing. Because if people ask me like, are you a repeat entrepreneur? I'm like, look, I'm an only time entrepreneur. Just wanted to solve this problem in the industry, wanted to help my peers in retail, right? Um, and so, you know, when I think about, you know, some of the biggest, uh, moments i guess the you know the biggest moments for us where we failed are when i knew we could do better like we knew the answer to things like with customers um, and we just didn't prepare enough right so for example we were going my co-founder jeremy baker and i so jeremy's like the tech genius part right so i'm like industry expertise he's like tech he's a repeat entrepreneur we're going to um a top you know, Fortune 100 retailer for a coffee meeting, right? And we had gotten the meeting. It was like very early on. We had found the person on LinkedIn, did a lot of sleuthing around. And, and we're like, okay, we're just gonna have coffee with this person. We're gonna pick their brain. We're gonna like, kind of like try to, you know, talk about the value, but not be too salesy, whatever. So, you know, we flag in, we get badged into the building. We go in, we meet the person and they walk us into a conference room with four other people and they're like okay plug in here and we had nothing right we thought it was like a coffee and like a meet and greet and whatever and so after that moment and we were just like oh god so after that moment I always say like okay everyone on the sales team needs to have a plan b you always need to be prepared I don't care how casual of a meeting it is but always be prepared to present so did you win that deal no <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i mean that was like a complete disaster right so uh that's awesome that's like okay like, hey, like let's just talk our way around the total fail cheers to that that's awesome that's the hashtag fail moment thank you for sharing but but then but the thing is though like it sounds like that ended up actually pushing you to respond by being more prepared organizationally for future meetings right and, and that's kind of my experience with and with all these things is that like y y you can't really keep score in the moment <laughs> Because mm -hmm, these, mm -hmm, these times mm -hmm. where it feels like you've really failed oftentimes end up being real wins, um, whether it's personally or for the company you know, in, in the long run. Uh, and, and vice versa, I think times that, that feel like they're huge wins oftentimes really aren't. Right? Yeah. Yeah, you learn nothing from winning, That's really. So I mean, all the failures, I think, uh, at least personally, led me to all the changes I needed to make every, yeah. every time. Uh, at least, at least I think in, I think there's even a conference called FailCon where they talk about the big failures and the people who fail one, two, three, uh, the fourth time they just do it, you know, so good. I think you're Alex, you're, you're kind of the, the manifestation of that and you, Melissa as well. I mean, you, maybe you were dragged into this, but probably you calculated every possibility before you, you, you join. And by the time you joined this path, to be an entrepreneur, I mean, you're doing very well. And, you know, from what I know about you, you you work extremely hard. Uh, it's not, it didn't just come to you. So those failures build build you. Yeah, and they also, I mean, they, they hurt like hell too, right? Because, um, you know, I guess like there are certain businesses that are just, you know, so they just sort of catapult straight to like venture institutional funding. And in those cases, if you're losing, you know, venture money, obviously not ideal, but the model's kind of built around that. 
Uh, most businesses, though, go through some sort of a, you know, founder, you know, you know, friends and family type situation where, I mean, I had invest, like my parents were investors, you know, some of my closest friends, family members, you know, when you're failing there, like that sucks. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, like, it, it, you know, people are always like, oh, fail fast, you know, move on. You're like, I <laughs> get it. But how am I going to walk away from like this check from my mom? You know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, love that. That is. That is, that, that's a sentence right there. Uh, you know, I'm going to postpone the category creation for a few more minutes because you just said something that I think uh, is worth mentioning. You, you, you talk about fail fast. We hear a lot of, you know, I, I think that in Silicon Valley, someone just asked me, oh yeah, I, I was just talking to someone and it's like, hey, do you, are you watching, do you watch Silicon Valley? I'm like, hell no. This is well, way too close to heart. You know, when I, I think I watched two episodes of Silicon Valley and like PTSD took off and I was like, I'm not watching this anymore. This, I've seen too much of this actually in real time. This is not fun for me at all. And, uh, and I, you know, I think that like sometimes looking at Saster and, you know, I was reading TechCrunch, there are a bunch of like sentences that people say, break things fast. I don't know, like, you know, what, what is, and Melissa, maybe we can start with you. What is, uh, What's a sentence or an absolute truth that you hear over and over and over in Silicon Valley that you know is a complete bullshit? You know for a fact that you've gone through this and it's not true. Uh, or the other way around. Maybe something that you've heard is, you know, never do that or this is not the way to do things in Silicon Valley and you're, you've experienced it to be the absolute truth for you from your experience. So I think what is really true that I didn't really understand at the time was that your early employees will make or break your company. And like kind of understood that at the beginning and we were just like incredibly lucky. We have, we had like amazing first hires. They set the tone and the culture of the company. Um, and in retrospect, I was like, oh, <laughs> wow, we're so lucky because that is so true um, around kind of just like building the foundation. I think one of the things that Silicon Valley doesn't talk about though, is I think the importance of culture in enabling the company to scale. And I, I mean, because I haven't heard as like, you know, phrases being coined around culture being- Like culture the, eat, eat strategy for breakfast? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Well that, <laughs> right? So maybe, maybe I'm just like uh, not in, I'm like in my own little like Marin kind of like- That's better. Hole, so. I'm glad you don't belong I'm to the core like, of yeah, we don't like socialize enough, but um, but yeah, but I, I, you know, I I I think culture, first hires, the importance of like co-founding relationships, obviously having that healthy tension, like that's something I totally agree with. I think that's super true. I honestly didn't learn that until later on. Um, I being an engineer, m- more of a left time is for brain kind of person. I thought that product mm-hmm. is the most important, the KPIs. And I think four or five years fast forward, I completely agree, I full-heartedly with what you said. Uh, and it's one, day, one thing to read about it, uh, but it's another thing to practice it. I, you sound like the kind of person that you're, you did it from, from day one. So that's, that's, that's I, I hear you. So early employees make or break your company. That's, that's the one thing you know to be absolute truth. What about you, Alex? I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. It, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, like ideas are not, in their own right valuable. Um, you know, because I, I sort of feel like now in this kind of hive brain mentality of, of the world, like, you know, kind of everyone has the same idea at similar times. And so it's all about execution. And ultimately then that's just basically who's executing. It's just the people you have. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think it, I would, com- and it's interesting is like the types of people you need in the beginning versus types of people later. Like, I th- you know, Vidmob, we, were, we had an incredible group of people early and thankfully, like, you know, they're basically all still here. We actually just had sort of like, we, we've now started on our five-year reunion, uh, or, I'm sorry, on the five-year anniversary, uh, we, we make sort of custom oil paintings. Of, oh, yeah, that's cool. Um, that's cool. Um, and we just sort of hung up, you know, basically like the first batch and it's essentially like the, the first 12 people who were here. What I think I would add to that though, is that there are times where you make bad hires. And, um, you know, this idea that it's like, it's a team, not a family. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think one of the things I did poorly in previous companies, we, we um, you know, we just it, like kept everyone. Uh, and, you know, it's, it really is about kind of like talent density. And 
if if you have sort of like the wrong people in that early you know foundation group, they really can set the tone in a in a in a negative way. Um, and and so I think there's a balance there, you know, between you know, you know hiring the right people and being willing to recognize when people aren't you know the the right, and, and then try to you know move move on sort of quickly from there, which is hard because like I, I tend to be a pretty empathetic person. Mm -hmm. um, it, but I think what we've seen is like in the few instances where we've had to do that, it's, it's been like some of the best decisions we ever made. Very interesting. I would also agree with you with the point about co-founders. I mean, I, I'm sort of you know, incredibly lucky to have, um, you know, sort of two co-founders who, who actually approach the world very differently from, from me and in different, you know, so uh, my, my, my co-founder, Jason, you know, is really very much like, operationally oriented, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, like a true COO um, and, and it's sort of brilliant in, in that regard where it would sort of freeze me up to do more, you know, sort of culture, you know, product, mm -hmm. sort of external focusing. Um, and we, we, we sort of like separate things and which in, and so together as we, we are a good team. And then our third founder, Craig, um, is just like brilliant in sort of like client engagement but the thing, and, and so when we brought, he was one of the first hundred employees of Facebook and, and you know, was someone who brought in a, a great deal of early relationships and founded our partnerships with Snap and Facebook and others, which, which ended up being really sort of formative to us. But what was sort of sneaky is that early in his career, he was actually a recruiter. Hmm. All right. and, and I think like, I, I never would have valued, like to me, it's like, you know, as a, as a founder, you think about, all right, I need my CTO and we have an incredible CTO, James is, you know, like the business would be nowhere without him. You know, you need, um, you know, your head of sales, you need, you know, like you sort of think about those things. I didn't value recruiting and, you know, having a, a co-founder who had that background just like totally changed the way we thought about things from an early period. And so like, you know, when we were like 20, 20 people or so, we brought in this woman, Lisa Manowitz, who had, you know, helped build out, build, build out monetization at Twitter and Pinterest. And it was just like such a talent beyond the level of what I thought we could, we could, uh, you know, bring in. But that was how Craig thought. And then we brought in, you know, Jill Gray from Facebook to run all of our like, creative operations. And, and like, I, I, my main point of advice to other entrepreneurs now is like, focus on recruiting from early on mm -hmm. uh, because to your point yeah melissa like it's it's like talent is is everything and it's, it just seems like people often like way undervalue that love it um we're halfway through i made my promise finish a drink <laughs> cheers mm -hmm. happy friday thank you for for sharing all your wisdom Um, let's let's talk a little bit about category creation. Um, Melissa, when you were dragged into starting a company, um, were you? First of all, are you? Do you feel like you're creating a category? Yeah. When you started, did you did you plan on it? We're just like focused on solving a problem, right? And I think like we're focused on solving a problem and building a solution that was essentially by the people for the people. It's like a lot of ways that people within retail locations and retail can be a lot of things, right? So a lot of people think like, just like the gap, but it also can be goods or services, right? But there's a, a thing around distributed location management that is very unique and different than other types of businesses. And there's a lot of complexity in how these organizations run their field operations from like a hierarchy perspective in terms of like you have locations and you have districts, regions, zones, blah, blah, blah. And so I think when we, when I first started and I, you know, was partnering with Jer, um, we were just looking at like, what are the problems to solve in each level of the organization? And then, you know, as we've progressed in the company, you know, over the last couple of years, it's become clear that the way that we think about the problem and how we're solving it is very, very different than how anyone else has approached the problem. And we run into this in the sense that we say that we do communications and task management, but I personally hate the word task management. 
right? Like I tell like our salespeople know it, like, and even like my VP of sales, like we're in a call, he's like task management. He's like, no, oh, no, no, doesn't like that word. <laughs> but it's the only thing that really helps people understand at least like the utility beyond like organizing work, but it doesn't really tell how we're enabling and empowering their people to do better work in a more organized way. That's like task management to me is like so punitive and mundane. And so I think it's just been over the past couple of years in seeing how others are approaching kind of like distributed work management that I realized like this is a totally different thing of an origin and communication. No one approaches it in the way that we do. And it's really about how do we tell that story in, in the market, right? And, and really begin to like carve out um, and make space for conversations specifically around kind of like this like communications first approach. Very interesting. Uh, you almost got into a sales pitch, by the way. I was like very close to making a drink. <laughs> oh, really? So was Alex like, nodding? He's like, yeah, I'm yeah. Halfway, halfway through this, like you may want to just finish a drink. Just okay, for, I'll like, do it. I'll do it. Uh, I, 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 don't, don't make me I was nodding because I was about to buy. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I know. I, it's very interesting. But to like, the sales pitch, right? <laughs> sales that means pitch. I was, I was pitching. No, you were doing great. I think it's very interesting to the extent where, uh, you know, today I was on a. We were. I, sh I shouldn't share so much on the podcast myself but i'm also drinking like you so um you know we're, we may or may not be preparing for some sort of an analyst uh you know like magic coordinates kind of stuff or not mm -hmm. and uh on the call you know one of the person that, that one of the people i'm talking to is like you know and i was you know interjecting in the call he's like you know it's really a, it's really a good idea to not have gil not have you gil on the call with analysts because you know you're 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 pretty much going to tell him he's wrong the whole time and I'm thinking about you, Melissa, sitting down with the sales and telling the sales what not to use. How do you, how do you balance? You know, you have a conviction. You have a very particular view, I think, about the future. You know your market very well. You spent 10 years in retail and you're good. So you're probably right. You may just be right earlier than other people. In fact, it might be that, you know, and Alex, I see you nodding. Like, this is the classic problem. Like, sometimes you start a company and it takes you five years until everyone else catches up with what, what you know is true. How do you balance between creating a category and telling everyone, look, what we're doing is different? And also fitting into an existing mindset or a universe, I don't know how to say it, just like a, essentially, a, you know, a thinking that is in existence that you need to fit into because it's a, it's a pattern because that's how you sell versus reinventing and saying, oh, this is different. We're, we're reinventing this, this space. How do, you, how do you balance those two? Well, I mean, do you want me to answer that? So I, I the thing I think is, it, it, you know, it sort of gets this idea of like being right at the wrong time is the same thing as being wrong. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's sort of the, the challenge for entrepreneurs where like, you, you have to be right, obviously. <laughs> but you have to show up at the right moment too, and then maintain that, right? And, and in, in VidMob's history, we've actually done a pretty good job of living six months, 12 months ahead of the industry. But, um, you know, there, there was a period in 2018 where we got too far ahead. And like, I, I, sort of, I think of it like, um, yeah, it's sort of like surfing, right? Like, you know, like if you get out there like 10 yards ahead of a wave, you're just sitting there. Um, yeah, but if, but you, and you, have to, you have to like continually stay uh, you know, on that edge ahead. Um, and I think, yeah, like, I thought what Melissa said really resonated for me. It's like, in the beginning, you really just have to, like, at least for me, uh, you, you have to set, I don't, I don't think you can set out to create a category. <laughs> you, you, you really do have to set out to solve a problem. Uh, because, you know, like, creating, it's, you, you won't have any credibility, you don't have any authority to create a category in the beginning. And so, you know, for us, like, we just, like, we saw a problem, which was, hey, I'm, I'm trying now to market across many channels instead of just TV. I can't keep up. It's too expensive. I don't know how to create for Facebook versus Twitter. And so we tried to just solve that problem. And as we did that, um, and we saw like the scope of the projects being created on our platform grow and so marketers were now making, you know, hundreds of pieces of creative across many platforms. We had to build a bunch of like workflow software and stuff. And that ended up then enabling us to, or, or sort of forcing us to start plugging into ads APIs so that people could like push a button and have all their creative go out into their Facebook ad manager and their Google ad manager, et cetera. And that then opened up the flow of data back at the creative level. 
And so, which frankly didn't actually strike me as interesting in the beginning because I, it was just like obvious, like, of course you should have data for how your creative is doing. But the thing is the industry, the whole in marketing industry split apart creative agencies and media agencies in the nineties in the great unbundling. And it's still that way to this day, 25 years later. And so like most creatives actually have no idea whether the decision, you know, the creative decisions they're making actually impact business results. Like they might win an award and they might be told it's pretty, but they don't know if that, if like including this, you know, female character versus this male character or this, you know, scene versus that scene or like this. And so it, it took us, you know, it was basically in our third or fourth year where we realized, hey, there's a category here. You know, like this idea of like intelligent creative, like building a software platform to refuse um, data and creativity and kind of undo the great unbundling. Like we all of a sudden realized, all right, our, our, our exercise here is to create a category. And at that point now we'd, we'd achieved some level of capital, we'd achieved some level of reputation. And I think had, um, you know, like the beginnings of the tools that you would need to start creating a category. Um, and, and, but I, like, I feel like you, I don't see how we could have like um, shortcut our way there. Like you sort of had, we, at least in Vidmob's case, we had to put in like four years of work to be able to even consider it. Super interesting. You know, I smiled when you said in the beginning, you know, I, I didn't, I you know I resonated with Melissa, you know, we, I didn't set out to, to start a category. I had, uh, the, I think two guests ago, um, CEO of Sendoso. And, uh, and I asked like, did any of you start the company thinking they're going to create a category? And he did okay. from day one. And, you know, I was surprised too, but that, that, that he had a plan ahead of time. And, uh, you know, for him, that was, that was the reality for, for many others. It seems, uh, it seems impossible. I think it's very interesting. Uh, I think it's the majority probably is more, more like you, Alex, and like you, uh, Melissa, that you, you're trying to, to, to fix a problem and then you're trying to change that. You realize in the past that you're doing something completely different than, than, than others are, are doing it. Melissa, do you find the, the same that for retail zipline, you are, you're, you know, in that path, you realize you are like black and white to what is existing. I, you almost use the, the, the sentence, the great unbundling, uh, unbundling, right? You, you use that multiple times. Are you using that in your, in your marketing, okay. Alex? Uh, yeah. And like blogs and things. Um, okay. Okay. You're just making sure that it's not the first time I feel like you, you've used it for category creation already before it, I was suspicious. Uh, <laughs> Melissa, do you feel like you're in your path, you're some moment happened that you realize you're doing it different versus when, when you just started? I think when our customers told us, right? So, I mean, I think like the thing is, is that it depends on why you create the company. Like, I don't think you should personally, I don't think you should create a company to create a category. Like <laughs> you should create a company to solve a problem. Tell me right? more. And then your customers will tell you if you're doing it in the right way and if you're doing it different than anyone else. And I think maybe, you know, for me, the insight around that we were doing it different um, than others is, you know, at this point we have over 60 customers. And so in the beginning of the company, you don't have that many data points. You have like a couple customers, right? They're like, oh, what you're doing is cool. But then when you get to, you know, 30, 40, 50 enterprise customers and they're like, no, you're doing it a different way. We've had um, actually almost zero churn since the very beginning of the company, right? So that shows like, okay, we're doing it in a different way and it's working and it's sticking. Um, so that to me was like, oh, aha, we are creating a category of our own. And Gil, to your point, like around talking with the sales team, part of it is just acknowledging like we are the closest to task management. I hate that word, right? We actually, and and how we train the sales team, and actually all of the company is that, this is one of Jeremy co-founders genius ideas, but he was like, we need to write a book. We need to write a book about like our approach, why we're different, our philosophy. And I was like, is this is like years ago. And I was like, I'm not gonna write a book. But we ended up doing book in a box, right? And we actually have all new hires read the, the book. And we're, so, I guess I'm supposed to edit it so it can be external facing. <laughs> But at this point, like, I don't know, but um, I think that that helps everyone get on the same page about what we're building, 
why we're building it, the use cases, like our approach and how we look at the problem in a more holistic way than just like features and functionality. And I think that is what, when you think about category creation, it's not about like one toggle or this or that, it's really about a different way of operating that enables organizations to, um, for us, like operate in a different way. And, and that is where I believe like the category creation begins is in the way of thinking about what you're doing versus in the build. You know, when you, it does make sense. It's very interesting. Uh, so many thoughts when you, when you just answered your, that question. Uh, when you said, when a customer told us kind of quietly in the beginning, uh, I was about to ask you, what was that moment where it was like a big deal that you signed? But then you said something crazy. You have almost zero churn. Is that yeah. like gross? You have yeah. almost so we've zero only lost churn? One, we've only lost one customer. So in the past like five to six years. That's insanity. That is probably why yeah. you had extremely oversubscribed Series yeah. A uh, to Z. Congratulations. That is yeah. amazing. That means that your product market fit was very, very early. Yeah. And that's, yeah, because I mean, you got, but I was spending, I spent 10 years working on this problem in, in a retail, in one of like the, you know, largest retail specialty retailers in America. So it's not like, it's not like I came and this is like where the liberal reluctancy is. It's like, it's not like I woke up in the middle of the night. This is like one of the things that I do dislike about Silicon Valley where they're like, Oh, you, you just have a great idea and you dream about it and you wake up and you do it. I was like, I spent 10 years like focused on this problem, couldn't solve it by myself, right? Couldn't find a good solution on the market and, and then did it. So the product market fit was a result of having literally spent 10 years in the field with stores, with headquarters, like living the life, like crying and drink, crying the tears, drinking the wine, right? Like at like 2 a.m. in the morning. And so um, I, we got a head start in that way. Thank you for that segue, drinking the wine. Uh, it is time to finish this one and pour a new one. Right. Alex, I saw you smiling a lot when uh, when Melissa was talking about uh, the first customer. What is the first moment that uh, that you realized that you're creating a category? Um, and cheers, by the way. Cheers. You're almost out, Alex. I think. I think for us, the first moment we realized we were creating a category was when we just got so much pushback from kind of the investor community on, on what we were doing. Uh, hmm. So what kind of pushback? Well, VidMob's not like exactly what the venture world's looking for. Like we're not 100% a SaaS business, right? <laughs> And so people wanted us to be just the SaaS data business. You know, they're like, that's exactly what we want. It looks just like everything else. Um, just a infinitely scalable, zero marginal cost, you know, pure software solution. And like, there's a lot of people that have recognized that this is a big problem. It was a $300 billion you know, problem with, with sort of, you know, creative and, and uh, and when you look at sort of like ad tech, you know, there's, I don't even know, a hundred thousand companies that are focused on varying degrees of like optimizing, you know, targeting or, you know, budget across, you know, different platforms. There's very little on the creative side of things. And what is on the creative side is all again, pure software. Like, so like algorithmic editors, easy bake template kind of things, like all the stuff that the Valley wants to fund. <laughs> and like we had this very particular view that was if you build an infinitely scalable, perfectly repeatable thing for communications, like that's great for doing your taxes and, you know, and, and for lots of things. But if the sole purpose of communication is to put forward some unique, emotionally resonant touch point for your brand, then if you have an infinitely scalable, perfectly repeatable thing, like the, literally the last thing you want is that. And so VidMob was like this combination of like human creativity and a data platform to augment it, to support it, to enhance it, but not to replace it. And like, frankly, no one liked it. Like all, all investors are always like, ew, like that revenue, like 
like, but you can always get rid of that piece. And we're like, well, not really. Like, you know, and, and I think it was after like, you know, a few years of that, we realized, oh, actually, like, this is really interesting. Like we're creating a category because this doesn't fit the mold. Um, it's not what is like easily like fundable. And it's why we didn't really have any like true competition. Like, you know, there's sort of a continuum from kind of left brain to right brain where you have like a bunch, you know, a bunch of creative agencies on one side, a bunch of sort of data and analytics, you know, type, you know, software platforms on the other. And we sort of sit like right in the middle. And it was ultimately, you know, we sort of, we'd been talking about our data platform. We kind of talked about it in this idea of like creative intelligence. You know, so it was like, you know, data on like why things are working or not. And, you know, one day we realized that that was like literally exactly backwards. In that framing, intelligence was the noun and creative was the modifier. And that the intel, you know, it's like implied that the intelligence was valuable. But telling some marketer that their ad's not working because of X, Y, and Z is interesting. It's not valuable when they then actually use that to make changes to their creative and put it in market, now they've achieved value. Like if we tell, you know, some pizza company <laughs> that your ad's not working because 98% of the audience is leaving before you show your call to action or your brand. And, and that, you know, 98% of people are just seeing cheese. That's an insight that's interesting, but it doesn't do anything. When we make the change to the ad and grow the, the you know, brand recall by 80%, now we created, you know, $800,000 in value on a million dollar, you know, ad spend, media spend. And so like what, what we realized is that it's actually intelligent creative, you know, flip it. Like the creative is the thing that the, the, the industry didn't want that like, or at least the investment industry didn't want. That's actually like the value. Uh, and, and it's like the applied data that creates the value. Um, and so that was really kind of like our path to realizing that, like, you know, there was a category to be, cre to be created here. And it was just because, frankly, it was so hard, you know, that, that like we, we could see every day that this is where we were creating value for our clients. But then when we had conversations with investors, they were just trying to like push us away from it. I find that fascinating. That's a, it's so, it's so classic what you said about the, the SaaS. I think that's another one of those, uh, absolute truths that is not true at all about you know trying to fit the mold of of the innovation uh for vcs and by breaking out of it sometimes you find that gold mine that is completely different uh i i find and it's just about listening to clients right like it really just like at the end of the day like listen to your clients about what they want and what's valuable for them um and have a viewpoint but um that viewpoint they'll often tell you what they need uh if you, um, and this is a question for both, if you had to assess yourself um, from zero to 10, where do you think you are on the category creation path? Yeah, I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll say we are um, one to two. Uh, I would have, at the beginning of this year, I would have said zero to, to 0 0.1, but, um, couple things have happened in the last like literally few weeks uh the Cannes film festival asked us to produce a, a part of a segment as part of their official programming on intelligent creative um so we produced that with folks from you know google and a number of agencies and nielsen and you know and so like that was i think a good sign and then i just got a forrester report um last week that's literally entirely on intelligent creative. <laughs> and so, I mean, like we were literally like dancing around here in, in, the, in the halls, but it, like, I would say we're actually doing a lot better than I could have imagined we would be at the beginning of this year, but it's still like, you know, we're we have infinity to go. Very humble. We're going to go back to that report. I am Elisa. I would say like four to five. The reason I say that is I think part of it is just in the analyst community, having the firms have more visibility to you. And a lot of times um, we're actually having analysts saying that we're coming up in customer conversations, like when they're talking with the, with the industry. So I think that there's more awareness about our brand I actually just brought on my head of marketing last March, like literally right when COVID hit, which was crazy. So um, it's, you know, I think we've definitely seen some, some movement there um, also um, just one of the analyst firms mentioned that we're best in class. And so I think we're beginning to being 
pieced apart, uh, a little bit different, I think, Alex, than, um, than uh, I think the approach of, uh, of having it as defined, but I think being able to differentiate ourselves now that we're in some of these conversations, um, because I think that people in the conversations that I've had, they, there's a clear um, separation between how we're doing it and how others are doing it and people see a need to kind of like create that space. Sounds like both of you are making really good steps on the analyst community with those, those, those wave reports, magic coordinates, uh, those grids, uh, which is very exciting. I think that is still the synonym for category creation. Uh, in, in, I don't know, 30 seconds to one minute, uh, Alex and Melissa, if you had to give one most important piece of advice to companies who are trying to make some, some, you know, some advancement, some progress, on that analyst, um, you know, tactic, trying to get some recognition, essentially trying to get some validation. What would be the one thing you'd recommend them to to do? How did that work for you? What do you think is the most important thing that happened to you? I think with us, it's just patience. Um, you know, when we started, you know, reaching out to analysts and, and talking about what we're doing, um, you know, we we really didn't see results you know, for the first probably year, year and a half. Um, it, it does take some time for people to um, sort of think, when you're talking about creating a new category, it takes some time for people to figure out what box to put you in and, and, how, to, and how to do that. And they need to start hearing it from clients. And so it's just, I would say, um, don't getting, not getting discouraged, you know, understanding that it's gonna take some time and, and just, you know, putting in the work uh, is, is what I would say. Patience and customer. Melissa. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I think it's pretty clear across all of my commentary, but it's all about the customer, right? Like the analysts are talking to the customer community. The customers are the most credible source of information. If your customers are telling the analysts that you're doing something differently and why and how you're solving the problem is more effective, they're going to listen to that, right? So, I mean, we're, I mean, it's clear we're incredibly customer centric, but I think that energy just feeds everything, right? And do you do anything, Melissa, like, do, you, do you do anything on that end? Like, do you have any proactive action, tactic, strategy that you put in place to get customers to talk to analysts and tell them how great you are and how different you are? Yeah. Or it's all organic? I mean, it's just all organic. That's, I think 30% of our, our customers actually come through word of mouth and inbound through others. So I don't know. It's just like, I'm not also the best fundraiser. <laughs> I'll be honest but it's like our customers results like you know what you're talking about like zero like our the metrics speak for themselves in that way so it's like you have almost zero churn like okay doesn't matter how i position something Here's like money. the results speak for themselves yeah listen didn't you just raise a 30 million dollar round like a month ago or so like i, I did i think I that did. you're in the 0.001 percent of fundraisers out there in the world uh, yeah i mean i think our customers God is there, right? It's not like my, it's not like I'm like a, a great fundraiser and like, you know, like have a great process. I think it's just, um, yeah, the results of the business. So you're a great fundraiser by being a great, building a great company. I think that's, uh, that's, that's probably better than just doing a big pitch. Um, all right. We are over time. Uh, we have three minutes left. Um, can you each leave one, one lesson learned, one thing for the, the next founder that is listening? that you'd like to give them a piece of advice that, that got you where you are? Um, I'll echo something Melissa said, yeah, just focus on people. Um, and I think increasingly like have a purpose, you know, like, and, and it can't be just about that, you know, business value. Uh, you know, for us, Vimob's mission orientation has really had a huge impact on the types of people that we attract it, it's helped us win people that could have gone elsewhere and i just think it's helped us avoid you know this like beat the quarter beat the quarter treadmill which just gets boring otherwise and this feeling that we're doing something that's more than building a company it, mm -hmm. you know to me um I, I think like my advice to founders is just be like find people you enjoy being around yeah. have a big problem and then have a mission or purpose that, that you know kind of underlies it all. Thank you. Melissa? Yeah, I mean, I feel like so aligned to Alex. 
I mean, something that he was saying earlier too, that I agree with is like, you just have to keep on going. The line to heaven is never a straight line, right? Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. I think, especially when you're dealing with enterprises, right? Um, it's more of like a stair step and a wavy line. And, and to me, sometimes like the founder journey can be really hard, like customers or employees and team dynamics. And every, every year you have a new job, right? It's like, you're doing something different every year. And so Alex, when you're talking about, you know, two years without taking any, any pay and just get kept on going, like to me, that's kind of like been my personal mantra, so. Melissa and Alex, I really enjoyed this. Uh, thank you so much. I really, I really learned a lot. Um, I think you said okay. some things that people are not going to forget. So thank you very much for your candor and for your energy. I really enjoyed meeting you today. Uh, that's it. This is the end of the podcast. Have a wonderful rest of the day and a great weekend. Yeah, well, thank you. And Melissa, it's great meeting you. You too. You too. Thanks, Gil. Thank you both. See you later. Have a wonderful weekend. All right. Bye. Thanks again for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed today's discussion and will tune in again. Find all of the B2B Category Creators episodes at metadata.io. And if you have any feedback, topics, or would like to be a guest on the show, please reach out. 